Hi, I'm Carly Shank, Assistant Director of Operations at the UIS Performing Arts Center. And I am so pleased to be able to sit down with our founding administrator, founding director, John Dale Kennedy, for a discussion about his experiences, uh, the early days of what is now Sangamon Auditorium uh, at what <clears throat> was then Sangamon State University. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we'll come to some kind of understanding about John's 23 years, uh, his leadership from 1980 to 2003. And we are so glad to capture this interview as part of commemorating and archiving the first 40 years of the venue. Yeah, it's great. So thank you so much oh, for happy to be here. agreeing to this. Happy to be anywhere. So um, tell us a little bit <laughs> about your time uh, your career path leading up to your arrival. So we just kind of know who the guy was sure. uh, arriving to run the place. Sure. Well, um, <clears throat> let's see. I should have brought my resume. But uh, I was at Cal State Long Beach as a theater arts major. And uh, then I stayed there and re I got a Master of Science in uh, Counseling, which served me well because I was heavily involved in advising student activities in the arts area bringing concerts to campus and speakers and things of that sort. And that was uh, in about 1974, I left. I got married in 68 to my wife, Ronnie, and uh, we left in 74 and went to South Dakota State University and uh, from Los Angeles. A little to, chillier yes, there. Yes, yes. That was a, <laughs> that was a cultural uh, awakening of sorts. And um, they uh, had a an activity program and I was the director of cultural affairs and so I had my fingers in a lot of performances, film, art, uh, advising the students in the student union and then um, uh, we had a, a, a small auditorium on campus that we would book and etc. And then um, I went, uh, it was cold enough in South Dakota but we wanted to go further north so I went to the University of North Dakota, Grand Forks, um, for a couple years, and then uh, the job here opened, and I applied for it. <clears throat> and I came here in, um, gosh, I think it was February for an interview. It's snowing outside. Of course, it was snowing up in Dakotas, too. Sure. And um, uh, took the job and arrived on April 1st in a U-Haul in 1980. Oh. So I had four universities, four, uh, uh, my fourth university, and uh, working in the performing arts, and uh, that's, when I came here, I really made the split from student activities and performing arts, because at the University of North Dakota, I had a 2,300 2, seat auditorium to manage, and the student, uh, student union, both of them were under my responsibility. So I, I, I wanted to get out of that bifurcated life and, and, and settle in, and, and that was probably 10 years into my career. So, and, and when you arrived here, Sangamon State University was still really new. Very I mean, new. We're, we're still really new by university standards true, now yeah. uh, and pretty small. Yeah. And how yeah. did that compare uh, to the institutions that you had been at previously? Oh, it was the smallest, of course. Uh, <clears throat> the other ones were you know, large institutions uh, with lots of lineage. Um, Sangamon State was, oh gosh, I think only I don't even think it was in double digits uh, in terms of its age when I came here. And um, when I w was um, interviewing, you know, you learn a lot about the facility and what they needed. And of course, I interviewed, and the building was already up. Um, the um, the short history is the university being a two-year upper graduate, upper class, junior, senior graduate, no undergraduate, and only had one building, and that was the Brookings Library. And they were building this multi-purpose um, classroom, meeting room, cafeteria, everything else in a, a V-wing. And the inside of the V-wing would be a thousand seat lecture hall. So where the auditorium is now, um, the community wanted a place for the symphony to play. I've often heard that, yes. Yep. And uh, the leadership in the community leadership um, actually brought about uh, the funding for the auditorium to be completed. The V-Wing was under construction, 
had been enclosed. They stopped construction for two years while they redesigned uh, what is essentially two buildings from a safety fire standard. There are two buildings here, okay. which is why you have some of the crazy hardware on doors. So anyway, there's uh, two buildings and uh, the auditorium part came along. They had to hire a new architect, they had to hire the acoustician and, and all of that was going on while well, I was not here. And, um, and there was uh, uh, the, the university was a, a reluctant acceptor of the building. Hmm. Um, you know, when you're gonna build a performing arts center, you, you better get the community to buy in because they're gonna the ones that are gonna have to fund it and buy tickets and so on. The uniqueness of this was it's all tax dollars that built the auditorium part of it, as well the V-Wing v too, just like any other building on campus. It was not funded by a donor or there was no uh, uh, fundraising in the community. So in a way, the community was separated from the creation of this building, except for the people who brought about pressure to the legislature and the governor over the heads of the university to get the money to build the auditorium. So that kind of birthing of a mother without a father is, <laughs> well, we know one other one, but uh, <laughs> that's very unusual. And <clears throat> as a result, it set up a lot of uh, obstacles um, for a performing arts facility to fit into a new upper division university that is just finding its own way and of course, the kicker is the legislature gave the university no more operating money. Sure. So where did it come from? Out of the height of the university that was there. Gee, who was upset about that, do you think? <laughs> so, yeah, coming into a situation where you've got a lot of people um, not sure what this thing is. Yeah, so let me make sure I've got the, the timeline correct. What you describe as the V-wing of the building was already under construction, oh, yeah. already constructed, yeah. when the decision was made to turn the plans for the thousand seat lecture hall yes. into the auditorium. Yes, and it stood vacant for, I guess about two years or something like that. Really? Or maybe a year, I, I, I wasn't here, but but the uh, it was definitely vacant while they went to work on, because it all had to fit together, you know. And, sure. Um, so, uh, Contrary to what I thought was the case, by the time you arrived, the, the building was here. Sangamon Auditorium, as we know it, was already constructed. There were already seats. It well, was outfitted, or did you get to have some st say in those stage systems? <clears throat> I got here in uh, October. The V-Wing was already pretty much coming along, and there was a lot of uh, movable equipment coming in. The auditorium part was um, still being outfitted. Seats had not been in yet. Floor hadn't been laid. Things like that were in progress. And so I was a part of that everyday sort of meeting with, the, with the, all of the contractors who had something to do with it. But there was a great pressure to get the viewing open for classes in sep um, September. So April, May, so <laughs> rush, rush, rush for that. <clears throat> in the meantime, um, we're trying to figure out when we can open up this part of the building. Uh, but at the same time, staffing, right? you know, operations, who's going to do this, who's going to do that, nothing had been done. So uh, I arrived with uh, an expectation that, I think I was given a secretary and, and a couple other people, none of which had any experience in the performing arts, et cetera. So, I immediately had to get to work and try to hire people. I, first person I hired was a tech director. Um, sure. And we, then we found out that uh, we didn't have enough rigging to light the place because there was things left out. So we had to scramble for money. We went to the foundation uh, and uh, got some money to rent lights for the mm. opening night in oh, wow. the following February. So no, it wasn't fully outfitted. Uh, we had to, um, gosh, I think about two or three years later, we finally convinced the legislature to, uh, or the governor, I guess, to give us some more money. I remember giving the governor Thompson a tour on backstage and he's looking up and says, yep, 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 you need that. And then bang, we got some money to finish off the rigging. 
and some permanent lights. So it was not fully equipped, but we... But you, you, know. you didn't get to be involved in any uh, structural choices then? No, well, no, not really, no. A couple changes here there. Uh, just a couple. Widen a door so a piano can get through, things like that. Sure. <laughs> so what was your first title and what were you charged with or what did they think they were charging you with oh, <laughs> when right. you arrived? Right, well, <laughs> that, um, <clears throat> that was a great deal of naivete uh, all the way around with a new building on campus and uh, campus politics, who's gonna run this, who's gonna run that, and so they hired a public affairs center manager. And, and that was you? That was me, right. And it was very clear that, that wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> There were territories and uh, 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 buildings, buildings, people, and uh, the academic area, and the continuing education, which was just getting started, and and um, th they weren't going to allow that c kind of an operation, which I had had in other places, renting out in the student union, renting out rooms and okay. uh, staffing them with uh, everything from uh, AV equipment to people to do this and that, and. You know, just meeting planning kinds of things. Uh, they they didn't they didn't know what that was. So um, I f found that I needed to find some. I found some allies within the university and said, "Look, this is not going to work." So finally, um, I don't know how that happened, but as we be people began to see that the the overwhelming uh, need for the auditorium to have uh, staffing and uh, a mission and a vision was critical. I mean, you had a 2,000 seat auditorium sitting here. There's nothing else like it within 80 miles or so. Right. You know, you got Cranert Center and Kirkland and so on, but th they didn't know what to do with it. There was a common perception that it was a white elephant, that the, that the community, it was way out there, seven miles out of town. No one's going to go there. It's a state building. It's another, you know, state mm -hmm. capital. You, this is a, everyone's got a little bit of cynicism about things of that sort and uh and 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 what's what's going to happen out there they you know they don't have anybody to run it and eh. but the idea that the symphony needed someplace better to perform it and i think i've heard stories yes. of they were performing at springfield high school correct, auditorium correct. With, and had ceiling tiles falling on them and, yes. and <laughs> thankfully that has been through renovation certainly since the 80s but i think um, so yes um so what was then the Springfield Symphony um, was going to perform here. So even before your arrival, was there an idea that this was going to be a roadhouse for touring shows, and yet nobody really understood how that worked? Or, or was it really even a blanker slate than that? Well, they, they hired a theatrical consultant, uh, Vince Piacentini, who, who raised these questions. I wasn't here, but he raised those questions. And when I got here, he was still here, and we had long discussions about this stuff. And, and those issues were raised. Um, and I, uh, I don't know how many line sets. We have 60 line sets, someone tell me. But uh, <laughs> that decision and the depth yeah. of the stage and all of that was a precursor to Broadway. You know, right. If you just want a symphony, all you, just, you don't need that much. So um, that's why the multi-purpose look at the at the um, at the stage uh, was critical to be sure that we had enough electrical. Uh, even though they all weren't, uh, the lines weren't all laid. We had the the places to put the electrical um, uh, uh, equipment and the line sets and everything else. So um, uh, I think we added some. We I know mean, we did. We added more in as as time went on. But the idea was to have a full blown performance facility and uh, the acoustician and the theatrical consultant and the architect all, I think, sort of convinced the university, not convinced because they didn't even know one way or the other. They just, the symphony led the charge. And, and luckily, uh, and the symphony, you know, prior to 1980 uh, was a community symphony. Mm -hmm. If you want to be in the symphony, um, you just, you know, you needed to I don't even think you had to audition. Oh. Uh, the conductor, the music director, said, "Okay, uh, Margaret, um, you can you can play the first violin, but you got to practice more." <laughs> um, that year, they hired a new conduct conductor, Kenneth Kiesler, music director, and that's where things changed because they auditioned, and the sophistication of the symphony changed overnight, 
and that I think was a help to uh, give credibility to the facility itself. Something when you were talking about the uh, uh, consultants coming in to look at making the space fit uh, for Broadway tours and such, I have often heard, whether it's anecdotally or otherwise, that this was just a very common thing that was happening in the 70s and 80s, that every university thought they needed a 2,000-seat hall. Uh, is is that consistent with your uh, understanding of, <laughs> of how this kind of came to be? That's just been one of the stories that I've been told. The like, one th- oh, yeah, you'll find a lot of venues yeah. that are around that age, right, you know, right. built sometime between 70 and 85. I, I wouldn't uh, doubt that. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, Braden Auditorium and uh, ISU up the street uh, has 3,200 seats, right? 32 Something or, like 36. that, yes, really close, yeah. <clears throat> Well, talk about overbuilding. Um, and, uh, of course, the Cranert Center is 2,000 seats, but that's a box. Mm-hmm. There's no rigging there. Their their biggest rigging theater, I think, is only not even 800. I don't, yeah, I don't Something think Something like that. So um, I, I don't know I don't know how they settled on 2,000. <clears throat> there was... There was a little bit of, of, of boundary by the structure that was already there. So you couldn't go this way much more. You had mm-hmm. to go out that way. Um, and yeah, frankly, another, another 10 feet in the back, if I were here, I would have said, let's, you know, you got all that room out there, just go ahead. And the loading dock is very small. Um, in fact, it was, uh, we knocked a hole in one wall so you could load directly in from the dock, directly into the, uh, using the elevator, elevator rather than uh-huh. going around the corner. Things like that were, you know, the, the people who ran the building were never consulted. I mean, the whole idea today, I mean, that's what you do. I mean, you should be doing, and that's what I did when I quit working was consult and try to help people think things through before the building gets built. But nobody wants to spend that kind of money hiring a director to run the place two years before it's under construction. Sure. It just doesn't happen. So you're probably right. A lot of institutions uh, uh, at universities, but many of those are legacy buildings. You know, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Biven Smith had a couple million sitting around, and uh-huh. someone said, "Hey, you know what? We need a new music building, and it, we'll name it after you." And I think a lot of them got built that way. Well, and you referenced several minutes ago about the community. Uh, and the the legislature having the support for getting the structure here, but leaving nothing for the university to operate it with. No. So when you arrived, did the um, given your experiences up to that point, I'm, I'm guessing you probably already knew that that was a problem that you were oh, going to yeah. be facing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I- and were you given the opportunity to decide what your staffing structure was going to be and how you were going to get this uh, this big empty room filled with people? And uh... Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, was I allowed? <clears throat> I, I spent so much time educating um, staff of this campus, everything from accounting. Um, I mean, these days you can buy software systems that you just plop on top of a university system and go with it. Um, This was the dark ages. It's funny you say that because we've never really managed to do that. Oh, I don't doubt it. But we have the the knowledge now to uh, to work within the university system. I don't doubt it at all because, (laughs) you know, you've got an academic system over here and you've got an entrepreneurial activity over here. And they just, the reporting just doesn't mix. And trying to... Uh, I, you know, I had some allies who understood how to do that, and we found ways to make it work. And plus, you want your staff to be able to operate um, independently, uh, whether it be the stage operation or whatever. And, you know, I was the fiscal officer for everything. Are you kidding me? I don't have that kind of time. And um, we had to set up accounts, and none of that was done. None of that was done at all. They had no idea that it took a staff. And... There was no expectation of what was going to happen, so the whole idea of revenue coming in and what do you do with it, and and if you're and well, the expectation was that whatever happens out there, they're going to they're going to break even. Mm-hmm. Well, that was another education that I had to give, and people don't like to hear those things. <laughs> so I really didn't think I I would uh, I would be here more than you know. 
for four or five mm -hmm. years, you know, burn some bridges and get out and maybe the next person can, <laughs> you know, pick it up and go from there because uh, people didn't, didn't like me. University people didn't like me. Well, Many and, didn't like me. And it's true. My to, mother to, liked me. To do that kind of work, I, some would say there's not a lot of ways to do it that aren't going to burn a lot of bridges. That's true. That's absolutely know? true. And uh, I, have to, I have to give a lot of credit, though, to uh, the commu so the, some of the, the community people who uh, I realized I had to get out in the community, and they needed to know me. They needed to know what we're doing out here, even if the university was not totally on board. I mean, we had a president that was in crisis, Alex Lacey, um, who was not helpful. Uh, we had uh, people within divisions that, you know, they had, they had their own areas to protect. Mm -hmm. And here's a new guy coming on that had a, <laughs> to talk about a black hole, I could suck up more money than anyone <laughs> on this campus and spend it on things that was, was not in the building. Um, the studio theater, when it went out to bid, was totally stripped back to the walls because there wasn't enough money. And so we didn't have this facility except for a, a soccer team used to practice in here when it rained. I often remember hearing about that. <laughs> it's it's not in my tenure, but yes. <laughs> it's true. Soccer practice. Uh, it's true. Anyway. <laughs> so, uh, uh, anyway, that's... So, so I, what, uh, the community. So you've said that you had to go out in the community. So what did, what did you find in this community? What were the expectations that had already been laid down? You've talked about the symphony quite a bit, but what other community organizations and individuals in the community existed that were behind this? Well, I, I don't, I, um, there was no organized group. I mean, there was an advisory group of some sort. I don't, I don't know how that got started. And, but I just started meeting with people and, you know, everything from the Qantas Club to the, to the PEO clubs and everything else. You just go out there and you talk about what's going to happen because they want to know, too, what you, what's going to go on, what's going to go on. And so uh, it was so far out there, you know, yeah. it was seven miles. That's a long way to go at night. It's still that way. It's still For seven so miles. so many It's people. still seven yeah. miles. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was important that I knew I had to put a face on this place because the face that was there was... Uh, sort of an upstart university to begin with. Um, and again, this is before me, and I'm speaking secondhand, and a, a lot of people uh, won't, uh, uh, will, will agree with me if they were around, but it was very a very liberal, uh, non-traditional campus. Uh, they didn't have departments. They had clusters. Of, right. you know, and a lot of strange things were going on in, the, in our country at that time that that people were sort of throwing tradition out the window in favor of something new and, you know, uh, and I, th I think that's what happened here. Um, and they f gave up a lot of that for this great academic experiment, which I think was in many ways working, but it wasn't community friendly. Um, so <clears throat> for the university to have uh, have this kind of a, very public facility and to invite the community to come here and and take their money <laughs> and was something that a relationship that hadn't been developed although the university did have uh, you know political connections there was no alumni that sure. you could you could yeah. tap into mm -hmm. uh, i think the first well i don't even i shouldn't say i don't know when the first graduate was but it was wasn't more than 10 years prior to that. So there was um, a lot of support for the arts. There was a dance company. It, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, at the performance level that it is today, of course. And there were other uh, organizations, uh, the, the Muni. Um, uh, uh, and they had, <clears throat> of course, they had their following. And, um, and there was some th a lot of things going on, but they were, but they were uh, you know, um, uh, small a amateur mm -hmm. focused. Uh, the symphony was a community symphony. Really, they they didn't get their chops for another, you know, four, five, six years after sure. Kenneth uh, whipped them into shape, and uh, that was a that was a godsend for all of us because they uh, they they really brought people here to the uh, to hear the symphony, and it was like, well, you know, maybe we can come back now. It's not so bad, you know. Parking's a pain in the ass, uh, and it always will be, I guess. But um, 
I was told the, um, the person who designed the master plan <laughs> was from California, and where you, can, where you can walk a half a mile from the campus uh, oh. parking lot to the <laughs> campus. Uh, but when I first came to, drove into the campus to take a view when I was on an interview, uh, I looked at the parking lots and I said, well, when are they going to build some more parking lots? And you know, that was it. That's a long, yeah. long distance to ask in the middle of winter. And, and at the time, we did have winter here. Right. Well, and since that time, we have built some closer yes. parking lots. Oh, yes. So for people unfamiliar, yeah, imagine the far lots and that's what was there. That's and there was there. no lot E on the back of the stage house. And right. what is the right. uh, close lot B south? That didn't exist. They right. just left those as empty green spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't a ring road yet either. Oh, really? Oh, it okay. stopped. You had to go on. It was a half ring. Okay. Um, the, um, back to the community again and the support. I have often heard it said that, you know, it's so hard to raise support, be it financial or otherwise, for something that's, that's already there. Um, and and <clears throat> so, as you s stated, this, this building had already been constructed. In contrast to what I've often heard about the Cranert Center at what is now our our sister campus, that money was raised for 30 years before anybody broke ground on anything mm -hmm, that was mm -hmm. to become the Cranert Center. So um, you're trying to build support for the operations and for the programming because this building's already been, right. been constructed. Right. Um, was it always the plan that um, this facility would serve as a presenter of performing arts, bringing in touring acts and uh, ultimately Broadway shows. Well, I, ultimately, mm -hmm. how quickly mm -hmm. how quickly did that happen? And mm -hmm. or and or was that you? Mm -hmm. And you were given uh, here's this building. We don't know what to do with it. <laughs> well, unfortunately, uh, what you what you stated is pretty much it. Um, they really didn't know what to do with it. They thought they'd have the symphony and. <clears throat> there might be a graduation in there. Um, the, the, no one knew the word presenting, uh, or there might be some, a touring coming in that maybe someone will rent it. Um, so yeah, it was it was a very naive look, but that that's you know that's why I took the job because I said, look, we've I can do this. Um, it was it was uh, uh, it was a time that. Uh, it was the best times. It was the worst times. Um, but the community, um, one of the first things I did when I came here, even when I was in, being interviewed, is I said, you got to start raising some money. You need to raise money for uh, capital, and you need to raise money uh, for operations, because there was none there. I said this to the university. I said it to every community person. Uh, and, of course, the university uh, was new, and it had a foundation, but they were sorely funded, uh, and nobody was really going out there making any serious uh, fundraising for any of its. Because, as you've referenced, there was no alumni to draw no, from. No, no. Or if they were, they were just ten years out of school right, and right, uh, right. not not having the kind of resources. But you know, there were places you could go to raise funds, banks, and places like that. That the, uh, the foundation did do some of that for peripheral activity that was needed at the the, the soccer team was a, a championship soccer team that needed mm -hmm. funds and uh, you know Aiden Gonelson our uh, our soccer uh, um, emirate uh -huh. was out there raising money and uh, had a very public face for good reason and uh, got Kiwanis to build a stadium and so on and so on so you know the, those entrepreneurial activities were happening in a couple areas, but uh, not not too many. A uh, radio station, of course, uh, had to raise raise funds, but um, uh, their overhead was <clears throat> obviously they had some overhead, but they didn't have a, a huge building. But you're right; the need for money uh, to operate was not evident, and so you know you had to go into the whole um, story example of what's happening in other places and and explain endowments, what was that. So that's when we got involved in starting selling the seats in the auditorium. And where, whereas we would, the plan was to set up uh, an endowment with um, I think 20% of the money coming in the first million dollars and the second million would go into operations or something like that. Mm -hmm. We had a plan that we would be able to um, 
fund uh, some capital. And repairs in the future, we knew we'd, we would need that, and things would have to get broken and, and so on. So, uh, so uh, you, you come on the scene. Um, I don't know if anybody gave you any targets of here's when we want you to open the building or if that was all you to decide what we need to do to uh, have some kind of grand opening of the building, mm -hmm. which we've just uh, passed the 40th anniversary mm -hmm. this past mm -hmm. spring of the building opening. Uh, how did those kind of events uh, come about and uh, how were they uh, successful at moving this forward mm -hmm. and developing a, a base of supporters and of attendees? Yeah, uh, um, th the, the completion of the building uh, was pretty much out of my hands. So, mm -hmm. but I was there watching all the way and um, I should, the com completion and certification and the punch lists and all the things that had to happen in a new building. And um, while well, that was going on and e uh, equipment coming in, everything from lighting instruments to whatever had to be broken down and tested and so on. So just because the building was completed doesn't mean it's gonna be able to work. So uh, that finding a time when that would happen, and I believe we had a, I believe we had a January opening and postponed it. It wasn't public. We didn't have. It was I mean, two, three months out. We said January, and then we said no, February. <laughs> and um, uh, at some point, I don't remember exactly how we said, okay, let's go on sale, and then we had to build a. A minor marketing effort to, you know, you know, who are we, where are we, and et cetera, so we, uh, et cetera, try to introduce the building to the community. We had a couple open houses, we had a couple free performances. Um, um, I'm trying to remember who that was. It, it wasn't the symphony because um, <clears throat> their first one was actually scheduled, but we had some free things uh, and invited people to come in and take a look around and. Uh, and we had good turnout for that, my, my recollection. Uh, we did not have an independent ticket office at the time, so that mm -hmm. was awkward. We were within the Bursar's office, and uh, I was one one step away from that. Um, that was just, I mean, the, the whole idea was the staffing to run this place are already here. We got guys who clean, and they can <laughs> clean here too. We have electricians over here, and they can do something here too. <laughs> We've got money people, so they'll sell yeah. the tickets. Right, they've got, um, they can do the tickets. So. I, as I look through some of that earlier material, um, I, I ha it's hard for me to place it in context. I mean, I was I was an elementary school student in the community, and I remember being here at some of the earliest events. God, but, thanks, uh, Carly. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I look at those materials, and, and they seem so folksy, and, but I think that's a result of, you know, yeah, print this form out and mail it in or walk it over to us with mm -hmm. your check mm -hmm. because, and, and, you know, we're going to have a bank of tickets on the wall that will pull the tickets right. for you. And that has nothing to do with, right. uh, with it being folksy. That has to do with it being 1981. And I think some people just have to put that hat on sometimes right. to right. remember. <laughs> right, right. Our, right. Our, uh, because we're so far out, seven miles, uh, <laughs> our effort was to get people to phone in. So, you know, the, uh, the auditorium is as close as the nearest phone. <laughs> so you pick up the phone, and we had phone, a lot of phone call, bank, and uh, people would uh, call in, and we would uh, take orders on the phone, because that was really the most efficient way to do it. Um, and there were other things we did to, to f fix that. When Alex Lacey, President Alex Lacey, left, he was fired, um, and there was a uh, a, a time when there was an interim president, and then Durwood Long came in. And Durwood Long um, uh, knew what was here. And his business office was headed up by a guy named Carl Long, not related. And I reported to Carl Long. Mm -hmm. That's when the clouds parted. And that's when we finally had some people in the administration who knew what I had to do, knew that you could not bring in revenues without staff, and knew that this activity 
was going to help the university in every single way, even though it's not related to anything happening in the political science department or in any other academic on, uh, program on campus. That was the big change, and that's when, that's when I thought I might stick around for a while. And how long into your tenure was it that Long became president? I, I think it was within the first five years. I don't think, okay. happily, I didn't have to suffer through uh, the first president much longer. No, everyone felt that way. It was mm. just, it was horrible. So uh, we, we, we became a little more mature after uh, we, meaning the, the, the university, mm -hmm. sort of grew up in many ways uh, in those early years, and certainly the auditorium did. We, you know, did what we had to do to, um, you know, comply with contracts what, from performing artists. And, uh, sure. I, we still struggle with that. Oh, I'm We're, sure you know, you do. trying to make sure I'm that sure they... do. <laughs> <laughs> university can understand the the nuances of right. the of the timelines right. and uh yeah. we we still i've watched every business manager and every director just you know mm -hmm. continue to wrestle that cuz there's no other way around it if we want to do this business and and have a a community and a campus that's really happy with what we're able to bring them right. we can't just throw in the towel and no no say you, no. no well it's just too hard it's to too hard to do, do those right things. right uh, but you know, over the years, there were times when um, the university, the university, poor Sangamon State University. I mean, from the very beginning, it was underfunded. When I got here, it was underfunded. Everything was underfunded. The university's list of things they needed, they went to the Board of Regents for every year. You know, they had a list like this, and they got that much. It was just a poor, poorly funded university. And to bring in a a building like this that needs all of what it needs to happen, and the expectations are that we don't have any money for this. Where do we get the money for this? And uh, uh, while you're operating, um, you try to find money to fill in holes. And my God, it was it was just uh, it was horrible. And then they got a couple of years. They got funding got cut. I don't remember the 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 reason. It was it was statewide. It wasn't just Sangamon mm -hmm. State. Um, funds got cut, and so we'd all go back. What are we going to cut? How's the university going to do this? How are they going to do that? And they just just never really got a leg up, the university itself. Sure. To the faculty positions left vacant. Um, some programs just faded away. They couldn't fund it. So there was some serious institutional uh, problems that was far beyond uh, the, un the institutions to solve. And um, then uh, coming under the University of Illinois was a big help. Uh, but, you know, there wasn't piles of money flowing in but because it was still, you know, it still was a, a high cost uh, per student to operate. Sure, sure. But over here in, in your department, um, what... Do you have a, a particular memory of, of a, you know, what percentage of what you were doing was being funded by state dollars versus soft dollars and how that evolved over your 23 years? I'm just assuming that yeah. as time went by and, and more and more support was built in the community that uh, you were able to do more with that money and able to have more soft dollars to fund what you needed to fund. Well, the expectation uh, in the community, just to going back for a minute, I found out was very high early on that, that they wanted these things. You know, they didn't know about funding or anything else. <laughs> they said, you got a 2000 seat auditorium. Wow, you can do this, 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 and this. And they wanted pop music. They wanted classical. They wanted this. They wanted this. Well, you know, but are you going to, are you going to pay for it? <laughs> Are you going to spend twenty five dollars for a ticket? So uh, yes, there was a um, th there was a a relationship between what we can do and how much money we can bring in, <clears throat> and how much the state's going to give us. The state, the state portion. And I say the state, I mean appropriated do tax dollars. That you could say it was tax dollars. The tax dollars used to support the total operation was uh, was was a minimal, and I th I think. I think when I left in 02 or 03, the, 
I think the last numbers I looked at was um, around uh, 25 or 26 percent of the total budget was institutional, which could have been tax dollars and state non-tax dollars, which means 75 percent of it was earned income. Right. Very high earned income. I mean, I, something to be uh, to be satisfied with from my standpoint. That was great, but we had to have the staff to do it. That's right. Ticket sales, sponsorships, um, advertising sales, uh, some grant money, very little grant money. Arts Council was as poor as anybody, but we got some money from them. But uh, at the time, I don't know, it was two, two and a half million dollar cash flow. Uh, 25 percent 20, of it was from the state, and and that was counting year end when you when you got some money at the at the mm -hmm. end of the year to buy things that you put off buying. So. Um, there was, there's no master plan. There was never in a, ma a master plan. I mean, even a, even a building at a, a university where they had community funding and everything. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, a feasibility study. Of of any sort would be helpful. <laughs> any sort would be helpful. Yeah. Because then you'd identify your, you'd identify costs and you'd identify uh, support and so on and so on. If there were a feasibility here, st study here, I'll bet you the university and everyone else would have said no. <laughs> well, and as I talk uh, to uh, like institutions at conferences and such, it is so hard to, you're never comparing apples to apples. You know, right. even, even if we have very similar size venues and we present very similar kinds of programming in similar sized communities, it's, it's still not, we're still not running a McDonald's franchise that does Broadway shows. Right. They're just not run the same way right. and supported in the same way. And um, it, it, sometimes I feel like, oh, there's only so much that the public wants to hear about that. But that's why we're doing these uh, these, right. these interviews right. to try right. and like solidify what was real for this place. And, right, and there's uh, a there's a the, the, there's a, a political side too. The university doesn't want to you know show its dirty laundry either, <laughs> um, and uh, they don't they don't want you to get in the weeds too much. Um, and frankly, I don't I wouldn't want to either. I mean, you've got to put your best foot forward and and and. You want to ask for money, but you don't want to cry too loud. You mm -hmm. have to show that it's it's necessary, it's important, and here's, you know, how much do you want to share the budget and what the university would allow you to do. I'm for a lot of sharing, but well, and there in my tenure, there have been times where um, we do a number of high-profile events. We're, we have a season that's really high-profile to the community. We get a lot of people in. Well, it. It costs money to make that happen, um, and uh, mm -hmm. you know that high-profile event that looks great to the community may not be paying the bills, but it's high-profile and that looks that looks good to everybody. But then it makes even the university, even when they see the numbers on paper, sometimes say, "Oh, but you did this big enormous thing. Mm -hmm. Surely you're not <clears throat> really hurting right. for money. Surely right. it's better than last year because right. you had a whole lot more people through the doors." Well, those things don't necessarily right. go together. Exactly right. You're exactly right. <laughs> Uh, uh, okay, so let's uh, let's talk about artists and events that you brought in here. Sure. So, uh, what's always at the top of your mind in terms of <laughs> what those favorite ones were for really uh, for huge success or for just your own personal satisfaction uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, to bring those things to the community? Well, <clears throat> I I've always liked. Um, a variety of things. So it, it's, I don't have a burning desire to bring, you know, a certain kind. I really, I really liked a lot of different things. Uh, but I also, I also, um, I also realized that early on that there was there was no way to measure that. Um, this is 1980. You know, there's 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 no way to measure what people would like to see. So. So you just look around and figure, well, this is an average American community. Uh, certainly, they would like this. Let's, you know, let's give it a try. Over the years, we did do some surveys uh, to to get some feedback. Sure. You know, and um, but um, I wanted to be sure that early on we had a variety of things because <clears throat> I wasn't sure if they would turn out to see uh, a cellist mm -hmm. <laughs> or or uh, or or. Boys' choir or things of that sort. So um, 
That's why we opened up with Hal Holbrook. We knew, people knew who he was. And of course, it, it sold out, of course. But that was opening night. It, it better sell out. <laughs> it damn well better sold out. <clears throat> $20 top ticket, I think, something like that. My God. People were afraid. Uh, I was urged to go a higher ticket, and I should have. Uh, I should have led with a much higher ticket. Uh, but I think it was 21, something like that. And that was that was pretty high for Springfield at the time. Sure. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, uh, they had to drive seven miles. That's to right, get here, seven miles so. all the way. Right. <laughs> I wanted to bring in Broadway, but we at the at the time it was only it was two or three years before we really had full uh, rigging on the stage. Oh, okay. So there were some limitations there, um, but I wanted to bring in classical music um, I, w without competing with the symphony. And by the way, we had community concerts here, which is an organization, uh, a presenting organization. Uh, totally independent of the university, that rented the hall and presented a lot of uh, interesting, uh, high, high quality kinds of things that I might present as mm -hmm. well. So they brought an audience in. And <clears throat> so... And did that group predate oh, yes. the opening of the hall? Okay. Oh, yeah. I, when I look at those lists yeah. of events, I figured they, they must have. They didn't just open the door. No, I think they were, oh gosh, I think they were 20, 30 years before opening. Okay. Yeah, uh, quite a lineage. And um, and I d didn't want to compete with what they're doing. Sure. And, and they're booking the, it's, it's booked differently than, uh, they're given an array of things to choose and then the community decides which ones to have and then they route them the performers accordingly and it's I think Columbia artists um, controlled it for years uh, and we would buy acts from Columbia as well so that was a good thing because uh, uh, I could see what audiences were what they were coming to <clears throat> and get a little better handle but at some point I had to make a decision six uh, six eight months uh, a year in advance before the, they had even before he'd even had those experiences so it was sort of a uh, let's let's try to bring in some Broadway. Let's just mix it up and do as much as we possibly can, um, realizing that the uh, the compromises we had to make with the staging. Um, I, I don't remember. I, I think the first Broadway show, the first we brought in was the Chorus Line when it was on tour for the first time, and that was sort of a coup because they did two performances, mm. and that was. Uh, uh, and then. Um, and you had. Probably brought Broadway to when you said you had a, a venue that was twenty two hundred. Yes, before. right. Mm -hmm. So yes. mm -hmm. you weren't brand new to Broadway. No, yourself. well, b brand newer maybe because mm -hmm. uh, I was only there two years. Okay, uh, but pop music, uh, you know, everything from country to a little bit of rock and roll uh, kinds of. So I, 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 I saw it with two thousand seats. You can do a lot, and thank heavens it was two thousand and not you know sixteen or um, something like that. Um, it was a good number, and you didn't have to fill the place to make money. Mm. Half a house would make, we, we made a lot of money on half a house, as I can tell you. And people said, well, there's nobody here. God, they must have lost a lot of money. No, you don't have to fill the place. Right. You have to, uh, you try to make your, make your nut, whatever that is. But, um, so there was some things that I knew weren't gonna make a lot, but we had a series, and so we had a variety series, and so if you bought this, you got that, whether you like it or not. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So you try to package things in a way that people get some things that they really would, you know that's going to sell well, yeah. and then a few other things, they come along with it, and then people are introduced to uh, to something they maybe may, may not have gone to otherwise. Now, when I came on board, um, we were we were uh, announcing two seasons. We kind of did the right. university semester thing. That's right, we did. did, right. Did that happen most of the most of your tenure that we announced? It, I mean, it gave you two opportunities right. to have a season announced every right. year. Not only that, it allowed me to uh, to pick up a lot of booking in the second half without sure. uh, having to you know buy into it right away <clears throat> that far out. Yeah, so we'd have like a May-June right. announce and then we'd have a December announce for everything that was happening right. February right. through June. Well, part of that w was uh, my philosophy that we needed to put ourselves in front of the public as much as possible. So if you come out with one series for the whole year, you know, they're going to forget about you midway. Plus, you, you know, I, I wasn't sure people were going to buy into a series. I mean, they wanted a Broadway series. Well, that's fine. You got a Broadway series. It'll sell. It won't be a problem with it. 
But then what do you do with all the other dance and, you know, jazz and all these things? They're not going to... But you can't package you can't it together. You can't package it together. So I avoided yeah. doing the Broadway series on purpose. I mm. didn't want a Broadway series. And uh, we were able to, to package that and uh, make, it, make it look... look you know, good, look fancy. And then, of course, people always say, why do you make us take that? I didn't want a quartet. I don't <laughs> want to say the Turtle Island String Quartet. So we, we got that kind of feedback. But I, what I was going to say is um, I didn't really like the idea of a series, but I thought it was important uh, in terms of packaging it. <clears throat> and so we didn't spend a lot of money on these fancy brochures. You know, we, 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 we had some, and they were nice, but I wanted to be out there regularly. So we started mm -hmm. the magazine. And it started off on a, on a four-page fold thing, and it, and it evolved. And we, that was a monthly magazine. I believe it was from nine months out of the year. Mm -hmm. People got something in their hands. This is before, you know, electronics. Right. They got something in their hands that said a lot about what we're doing, about the rentals, about uh, rentals meaning the symphony or the ballet company. We would give them space in there. And it was, it was a way to introduce and keep us in front of the people's faces. And uh, that, I, don't, I, I guess it stopped when I left, or maybe before I left. I don't remember exactly when. But, but it, it was because, you know, we were right, in a different era. A different era, right. And, um, but I felt that um, that was a big help because people... People got to hear from us nine times a year, yeah. whether they wanted to or not. And, and some of the things I always remember about that on stage magazine, nine months a year. Yeah. One was that my mother just had a place in her magazine rack with it, and the new one would come and she would <laughs> replace it out. And maybe she hadn't even looked at the one from the month before. Oh, really? But she was just always going to keep it and and play, you know. And then at any point, she could pull up and and see what was see what was going on, what was right. coming up. Right. And the other thing I remember is. Um, when I was when I started, we had two uh, marketing professional positions on the staff. And when we hi had to hire the top position again shortly after I arrived, I remember everybody talking about, "Well, you're the director of marketing, but really you're a magazine publisher." <laughs> That's really what this is all about. Um, and it had evolved from being, you know, as you described, like a simple newsletter. When I look back at those mm -hmm. archival copies from the 1980s. Until it was at the time of your retirement, like a slick magazine, mm -hmm. bright colors kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it, it that really did evolve. I also, in my earliest years, um, I think one of my earliest months was the first time we started selling tickets online. I okay. think in two thousand one, in the spring of that year, um, was when we first went uh, online with ticket sales. We had a website, at <clears> least <throat> when I arrived. That was already functioning. But right, but you, you couldn't, couldn't get your tickets right, there. Right, right. That, was a, that was a big revelation uh, countrywide, yeah. Um, yeah. Everyone started getting into that. And not only could you uh, sell a ticket, you could collect data. Sure. And then from there, you could, uh, do, a lot, you could do a lot. And, uh, and we quickly learned how to do that. And uh, uh, we were... We had the advantage of every ticket had to go through us. So whether it was Symphony or whether it was whoever it was, we picked up that data as well. And if they wanted to use our list, we'd let them use it for something. You know, why not? It's a community list of people that went to concerts and whatever. Right. So anyway, it was a pretty big list. Another thing about being out there, though, you personally were mm -hmm. out there a lot. Yeah. And I'm sure that came from those earliest days of you building community support when there wasn't a whole lot to show uh there was yourself to be hey here's this guy uh thumbnail picture of you in the in the magazine every time to be able oh yeah he came and spoke to my uh mm -hmm. rotary club right. uh i'm sure is where that came from yeah and i wrote uh, a, i wrote a column i wrote a yep. column every every month and um uh, and that was um uh, that was fun um sometimes it was I, mean, I tried to make it interesting, you know, not mm -hmm. just, well, this week we're bringing, you know, try to make it interesting because people needed to see something beyond the university mm -hmm. that they could, they could identify with. Uh, there was no, you know, even though it was upper division, uh, we had an older, older student population because of that. And so we did have a lot of adults coming here as students sure. that, you know, that had had some experience in, um, in 
uh, in the performing arts uh, as a viewer, go, going mm -hmm. to concerts, et cetera, et cetera. So th that helped as well. And as, as the curriculum grew and the student population grew, uh, I, th I think there was, then, you, then, then we were owned by them too. Again, back to the alumni thing. It was part of the, part of the local team. Mm -hmm. uh, and they sub and I hope they supported it. I don't know. When um, when this campus became a campus of the University of Illinois, I believe ninety five was mm -hmm. the year for that. Um, the auditorium went from being the SSU auditorium, same State University auditorium, which had always been its name, no other branding beyond that, um, to you retaining the Sangamon name right. and continuing and that building or the that uh, room continuing on as Sangamon Auditorium just having dropped the state university part of it right <laughs> right um and and so what was the choice there about i know you got you got grief and praise about mm -hmm. retaining that name over the years <laughs> yeah uh I, I don't i don't recall the grief part maybe we'll talk later um uh the um the, the the choice was actually I can't remember exactly where it was made, but it was I believe it was uh, the chancellor Naomi and um, Naomi Lynn and uh, a couple other vice presidents and you know early on we had this discussion. I said, what are we going to do? It was Universal Sangman. Oh, okay. I mean, I didn't have to make any argument at all um, okay. because most of those people were hired under Sangamon. Sure. So they had an affinity to it. And Naomi was new coming in and, and she saw the connection. She said, no, I'm not going to change it. I mean, if someone came along with a couple million dollars, you can name it the Smith Hall. I think we all wanted to do I, that. I know. I know we <clears> didn't favor <throat> we, that. And yeah. in part, that's why, you know, a name change to that room has never happened because we're, we're waiting for that person. Right. To, we're still to come waiting along, for that so. person. <laughs> it's a great idea, but if you don't get out there and beat the bushes and try to find someone, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, and it's already here, right? Get back to that whole right. <laughs> idea. But, uh, you know, $2 million endowment would certainly be nice to for the operation side of it. And uh, that was always, when I first came, I said, that's what we need. We need a $2 million endowment. How do we get it? Well, we can sell the seats in the auditorium. But then we, we never really, the university's foundation was just not ready to do that. And I, I didn't quite realize that. Sure, sure. You have to have the right people in the right place, too. Just because you got the position... You got to have the right people. Um, what oh, you, you want to talk about, about staffing? <laughs> well, sure. Okay. You talked about, um, and I don't, I don't want to make us last too much longer. Have mm -hmm. I exhausted everyone in the room? Probably. Um, you mentioned uh, first person you hired was a tech director, and Scott that was Scott Wilson, Wilson right? right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Scott was with you from from your from his arrival shortly after yours until mm -hmm. yeah, your retirement. That's right. Yeah. Um, he came from Braden Auditorium, okay, which had a fully rigged stage. It was a huge auditorium, so he he was doing it. Uh, he was doing it, and he he came here and he knew exactly what was needed, and so I mean, he really was uh, a champion uh, of the stage. Sure, um, and and it put in the years, you know, right. with you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, what other uh, longtime staffers come to mind? And, uh, and what they're their contributions gone. were. I don't know. They're all gone, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you're the only one, Carly. I'm, I'm the only you're one. You're the Man. last one. Well, and Jenny Davis, running valet. That's right. Jenny's running mm -hmm. valet, right, isn't she? Right. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot of turnover. Uh, you know, um, it was very hard to hire staff because th they wanted everybody to be civil service. And I said, no, it's just not going to work. It just, I mean, I said no, like I... Like I, they listened to me, I had to convince a lot of people that we just couldn't do it. You had to have administrators that you could hire out of state. We have to yep. advertise nationally for professional people. They're not necessarily in this state, um, and if they're in Chicago, they're not going to come to Springfield. So um, we had to recruit certain positions out of state, and civil service. We use that for many of them, of course, but uh, the specialty positions, the marketing and <clears throat> marketing people uh, were academic, uh, which gave us ac a academic, what? Academic, academic professionals. professionals. Mm -hmm. And that, that gave the ability to go, you know, go higher differently. You had to have a search committee, uh, which was, oh God, it was just horrible, horrible. Did, did horrible. that designation of academic professional, that 
predated uh, University of Illinois. That was even in Sangamon State. Yes. Times yes. That it, okay. Yes, that was a statewide designation of, of employees in the civil service system, or in the employee system, and th there were others. Uh, but we used the academic professional one, and um, it was a little harder to uh, recruit because you had the the search committee. Uh, for certain levels, if I remember correctly, and, uh, and that was lengthy, and um, the hiring and firing was was a chore. Uh, it was a chore, and it was like that at most universities, so it wasn't something that was new to me. Mm -hmm. Every university had similar kind of bulky, slow systems that are perfect for academics, but not so much for... Yeah. 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 Um. We've been talking about the requirement of a degree, which I don't know if that, um, that definitely came with the University of Illinois academic professional uh, positions that always required that a person have a degree. And I've always just felt like that's probably just higher education placing that value mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on having that degree. But sometimes mm. that's not always the best person for the Yeah, job. <laughs> I don't know that that was the requirement. It may, may be now, but I don't know that it was, because I think, um, I'm not sure. I might have hired somebody who didn't have a degree. Maybe not. <laughs> weeds. That's the yes, weeds. Yes, weeds, That's weeds, weeds. In the weeds. Uh, what are some of the early sellout or near sellout events? Oh, <clears throat> boy, that's, that's weeds too, actually. Uh, <laughs> who sold out? I don't, I, you know, I, uh, of course, the opening night we did, and we brought in Chorus Line. And we had some comedians. We had George Carlin, who sold out a couple times. We had Bill Cosby, who sold out a couple times. Um, the audience loved him. It's just amazing, but it, it, he was just so popular. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, several comedians, I'm trying to think who they all were, but um, that, that, that sold out. Well, maybe that's weeds, because that's, uh, you know, that, that's one of those populist kind of questions about whether an event is sold out or not. Mm -hmm. And that's, <clears throat> that's tough territory, because you know, especially these days when there might be tickets that are being held and you mm -hmm. still want to be able to sell them the week of the event. Right. So you don't want people to have the impression that nothing is available and it's all sold out because right. you still right. want to receive those calls three days out and sell those last few well, tickets. Well, yeah, I never, I never baited the public. I, I, I hated baiting the public. People wanted, uh, well, you better hurry up because they're selling fast. You know. <laughs> Well, that kind of crap. It, it just, just they'll turn on you if you do that too often. We, uh, we did a lot of Broadway shows that were. <clears throat> we did a lot of Broadway shows before we did our first full week Broadway show, mm. because we had to cut our teeth and make sure that those companies could trust us to follow through with what we had to do for them, the touring companies. And so we had a lot of weekend uh, split weeks where we would do four or five performances. I did not like to do the front end of the week, and I, I held off negotiating and not taking those front week uh, front end because it, this was not a community that was just not going to show up right. on the week on the on the front end. Now, I mean, that's different because people change, and you can get out here faster. All that seven miles, it's a little faster. But <laughs> so weeknights was it was something I tried to avoid on the Broadway shows, and we did split weeks and. And then we did our first, uh, uh, our first full week with Les Mis. That was 92% sold out for eight performances. Uh, th th that was a million dollar gross. And, and that, that, was, that was 1990, I think. I think it was 91. 91, okay. <laughs> right. <I remember laughs> 91, right. So, um, it was in January. I know it was in January because it was <laughs> snowing and we had the searchlights going and and what was happening at the same time, do you remember? Ooh, uh, the war had started. The Gulf War, right. Maybe it was 90. I thought it was 90, 91, but anyway, it was January, you're right, and it was snowing. and uh, and. Because I, I remember that barricade coming onto the stage. Yeah. And, oh, oh, yeah. we have soldiers at war. <laughs> we had a, in the, in the, in the lobby, we had a, a tower of power with a TV screen on it to show previews for coming attractions. And at the intermission, someone tuned it to the news, oh. and everyone was out there watching the, watching the TV and the bombing going on, and uh, there was a lot of anxiety about that. Uh, I think that was opening night. It was a Wednesday. Mm. Or no, it was a Tuesday opening night, I guess. 
So when we we did that, it sort of uh, um, gave us more ability and confidence that we had an audience that would buy into that kind of a thing. And I don't know what the top ticket price was. I mean, we had had cats uh, early on for a split week, split week yeah. and Miss Saigon and uh, others like that. So, uh, and that was the first that was the first tour. And those are hard to get. Mm -hmm. You've got to have the audience for it. You've got to have the gross because if the company doesn't think they can make enough money here, why would they, it, their fee is hundred thousand dollars? Okay, they're not going to come here for hundred thousand dollars. They're going to come here for for something plus, over plus, that plus 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 plus, plus. right. So um, we had to show that we could do it, and we we did. And I think we you know we give credit to the community for uh, showing up and buying the tickets and and wanting more. So. Uh, that was gratifying, knowing that uh, people would would come out, and and I, I really mean it about the roads. <laughs> they got better. <clears throat> the ring road got completed. There were a few stop signs put in. You know, stop signs moved uh, as well, and people uh, began to feel more comfortable. And we had pop shows and country. Johnny Cash. We had the Osmond Christmas show. Johnny Cash sold out. The Osmond sold out, and uh, others like that. Um, country, uh, the, uh, I can't think of the other ones, but uh, but the Roy Clark Christmas mm -hmm. show, you know, uh, things of that sort. They, the other pop music as well, Art Garfunkel and comes to mind and um, that we got good audiences for. And so you, you try to mix it up. Those obviously were not on a series. We added those in as they become available because they had a shorter booking time, <clears throat> time period. And we hit on some, a couple really really nice performances. I booked Lady Smith Black Mombazo eight, I don't know, six, eight months before. And in that six to eight months, they just went like that. And we sold out. Yeah. Sold out Lady Smith Black Mombazo in wow. Springfield, Illinois. I never would have thought it. I just never would have thought it. But Thank you, Paul Simon. Absolutely, Paul, <laughs> Paul Simon. And then we had him back afterwards, that t t too. And, and then we got into a lot of pop music, like uh, you know Beausoleil, and the Celtic thing was very popular. People like that. Mm -hmm. um, um, did we do the Chieftains here? I don't think we did. I think so. Uh, they have been here in my time. Yeah, I, don't I remember if it was in yours or not. <laughs> and cherish the ladies uh -huh. and all ten and all those great Irish groups. Not always in March, but we tried to do it in March to. You know, take well, advantage. Well, in another week-long Broadway show, my first week-long Broadway show was Riverdance over oh, yeah. Thanksgiving week. Right, right. And I think that was another big yeah. winner. It was a big winner. Yeah, people wanted to see it over and over and over, and I can't believe it. <laughs> and, over and over. Yeah, I know. And a couple years uh, prior to that, when I did not live in town, I was out of college um, and living away, and I remember my parents calling because they had bought tickets to, oh, you know, that new Broadway show that, that won the Tony Awards, and, you know, with the young people and the AIDS. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> They're doing Rent at Sangamon Auditorium, uh, right. and it was really early in yeah, Rent's life. Yeah. And you also had a right. week of Chicago that right. same season. That was their last week. I don't mm. know if you knew that, but it was their last week on tour, and the company uh, uh, dissolved. And... Uh, uh, in the weeds, but I think that I think they went to Chicago. They went to uh, who? Who went to back to New York and filled in while they restaged something? Yeah, I, they were on the road huh. here, and uh, it was their last performance. And I think it was Chicago. They they okay. wanted to restage it. Anyway, um, that be that as it may, um, that was an interesting turn of events for them. The cast they got another week long salary or two week long salary. Well, I think we've exhausted a lot of topics. Okay. And uh, <laughs> we've got a lot of great uh, content here. Was there anything you were hoping I would touch on today that we haven't uh, ventured into? Uh, I don't, Carly, I don't think so. If you, you know, it's um, <clears throat> not really. Uh, it, it was, it's been a, it was a joy for me to do all this. Uh, I mean, it was really fun to do it. Um, I don't know that I'd ever heard that you were only thinking you would be here for four years. Yeah. I, I don't think I'd ever thought to ask you that kind of question about how that plan worked into your whole life. Well, so. next time you talk to your colleagues someplace, just, just ask them what they think the average tenure is for a director or an auditorium. Oh, or something sure. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's relatively short. So I mm -hmm. thought, well, I'll, I'll be here a few years. We didn't 
we didn't buy a house for that reason. We rented, and then we then we bought a house, and but that was just I think because it was a good a good opportunity at the time. But um, yeah, and you know, there were times over the years that uh, I was asked to look at another opportunity, and, and uh, uh, I wasn't actively looking sure. for for jobs, but I would be asked to interview, and a couple times I did, and I don't think anyone knew it. Um, but um, I, I enjoyed every minute of, of, of doing it and all the trials and tribulations and all that, you know, it goes with the job. Well, yeah, I think that's the short tenure goes with it also. Yeah, you yeah, kind it of does. alluded to it earlier that uh, sometimes you got to really shake things up in order to get the good work done, and then you, you've you burned some bridges, and yeah. it's time to move on. Yeah, I'd been to three universities in 10 years, you know. Sure. <laughs> that wasn't a very good resume, was it? <laughs> but you... Um, I was also alluding to earlier how you were so present in the community. And um, I mentioned to a friend of mine who is t uh, 10 years younger than me that I was going to be doing this uh, uh, it, this interview with you this week. And, oh, he remembered the guy from over the back of the chair. <laughs> that guy? Is that who you're talking about? He's 10 years younger than me. Oh, my God. So, it, you know... It, it really left an impression on everybody, and I think it was yeah. really helpful for this organization to have a face. And thank you for mm. being that face oh, and, and, and sticking it through and uh, and letting the bridges burn, and then somebody else can rebuild them, <laughs> or they can just spontaneously rebuild themselves once that uh -huh person gets over it or that organization gets over it so we can all move on. Well, I, if you remember when I left, I, I gave a year's notice too mm. because I, I knew that they, you know, I wasn't going to, there was no bridge to burn. Right. Um, so I was, I was past that. I was building bridges rather than, so that whole year was an opportunity for, you know, some readjustment and whatever. And I won't sure. go into what happened after that, but, uh, and it has nothing to do with Robert. Nope. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it people think Robert came in after me, but um, there were two, two others, right? right. Yeah. So <clears throat> short-lived, but yeah. No, I had a great time. I enjoyed it. Well, we're glad that you're still here in town, and thank you so much. And thank you. we will uh, get together to do this again. Okay. With some others. All right. John, um, we're here in the studio theater. Tell us a little bit about this space and what it was planned for and how it evolved in your time here. It is one of the most bizarre stories. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Um, the university did not have um, a theater program, uh, an academic theater program of any kind in, in the early years, but they did theater. Uh, it was a, a kind of a co-curricular kind of a thing. And there was a professor named Guy Roman who was on faculty and um, convinced the university that it needed a black box theater. He uh, was uh, involved in, in its configuration and what was supposed to be here, et cetera. And <clears throat> um, this was before I came. And then while it was under construction, he, he, he either quit the university or was fired. I'm not sure which. <laughs> uh, he, he'd left to California. And um, uh, let's see now. OK, so he was gone. The, 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 public, the, the, the new part of the, uh, of the, of the um, um, before they started construction on the auditorium part of it in the studio theater, it went out to bid. It came back in and it was, oh, I don't know, half a million short. This is in 1980 or 79, 78. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was a half million short or something like that. So they had to come back in and redo this, strip that, strip that, do this, do that, whatever. And so the studio theater took the biggest hit. And... Um, uh, what was what was here was this balcony that runs around the grid system, which was a walking grid system, was gone. There was no floor. There was no lighting of any kind. No seating. 
it was just a, it, it was a concrete, um, it was a concrete cube with a with a uh, um, a booth with nothing in it. They left a lot of conduiting, I believe, so they 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 could do things. And the um, there's a few dressing rooms back here. Um, there's a double double door going across the hall into what was going to be the scene shop, which, which uh, after a while we sort of divided it, gave part of it to, to the building services mm -hmm. for storage and the other part we used, and that was Scott's home, and he did everything down there that needed to be done for us. So that's the way it was left. We got, uh, when we went back and uh, tried to get some more money to put the rigging in up, Upstairs, we, I think we got a little bit of money to put, to to make this work in some ways. I don't think we got the floor at that time. Uh, so no, no, we did you, not. You've maybe no. opened upstairs. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And this is, and this has just been an empty shell with a balcony around it. Right, and they did banquets in here, mm -hmm. uh, practice soccer, uh, frequently, <laughs> um, and uh, it was turned over for. Scheduling to the um, to the uh, uh, it, um, what was continuing then? education. Continuing education. Yep. And they had uh, all of the all of the rooms by then were scheduled by them, uh, and um, and this room was also scheduled by them. However, if I booked the auditorium, this automatically went with it because we use this as a rehearsal space for um, for the whatever performers were here and. You know, if you do the ballet, you've got to have places to put, you know, ten thousand kids, mm -hmm. and so, so we used used it a great deal, and you, and we needed the dressing rooms, and so sometimes we had to use the dressing rooms, and and this was um, had to be could could not be used for something else. Uh, we oh, sure. yeah, we used it for our um, concert comments. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a little chairs and a stage, and and we would invite someone from the show to come out and uh, and and talk. Prior to the show, so so uh, at some point we got some money. We brought in a consultant um, to uh, to outfit it. It was originally conceived to have uh, seating banks that would move around, so you could have thrust, you could have uh, in the round, you could have stadium size, you could have you know all kinds of configurations, <clears throat> and that kind of seating was pretty prominent um, and uh, in, in the industry they made the it was a series of seating uh, that, that pulled out you didn't have to have risers or anything and they stored underneath which was part of the original design they st stored underneath the uh, the balcony so we, f we got some money to do all that and put a floor in and some equipment I believe sound equipment but, but it still wasn't the, your department's No, space. it wasn't our department, and so we, we really, uh, you know, we, we didn't have the maintenance for it. We, it was done by uh, building services. Um, it was a bit of a pain in the ass to move because they were so huge, um, but the idea was it would be flexible, and again, we have no theater department, right? Right. So, but it was outfitted for one. The theater department, the academic theater department, uh, snuck in, and I say I say that in a good way. We're, we're able to sneak in when we became a four-year institution, maybe even before that. But I, th I think at about the same time where we developed a theater program. It, there was no major here. It, it took forever to get a theater music major here because, in the hierarchy of deciding which university gets what programs. If you've got eight universities, they've all got a theater department, you don't need another one. I mean, this was the mm -hmm. argument. So it was years before that argument came about. I mean, there are departments in this country, theater departments, that turn out professional kinds of people that would kill for a facility like this, fully outfitted, right. as designed. So it was here by a fluke, didn't get fully put together, until much later, even before the university itself was able to uh, put together an academic theater program. Um, I think those wagons came to be in the late 90s, shortly before my arrival. 
I remember Chuck Fudge yeah. showing them to me yeah. when I was here on <clears throat> interview as if this was, you know, still a relatively new thing to have the purple uh, wagons in this room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. my memory that, of it. That, that, that sounds about right, yeah. But alas, never utilized as designed. Does that help? <laughs> do you want to do something just to end the session? Oh, um. In, in into the studio theater part of it? Do, I'd like to know, was there any programming and then go into a, you know, once again, this is John Del Oh, uh, what, what, uh. We're, are we still rolling? Did I ever program this? Yeah. Just asking oh, for Oh, did you, did, did you ever, um, did you ever put programming into this space? Sell tickets in this space. Right. Um, you know, we, we might have, uh, but it was, it, it might have been a, a, a preview of some sort, um, but I, I don't recall really s selling seats uh, so much. We did, um, we, as I said, we did the uh, concert comments and the pre-show discussions, pre -show discussions mm -hmm. and the uh, symphony did their concert comments in here. <clears throat> um, and we would have uh, receptions in here Many times after a show, we the performers would come down and we'd have a reception. But a, as a programming um, space, um, no, I, I I did not use it. I had my hands full upstairs. <laughs> well, thanks for bringing us uh, some more information about the evolution of sure, this room. Sure. Sure.